Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 15 The Forest God When Clayton heard the report of the firearm he fell into an agony of fear and apprehension. He knew that one of the sailors might be the author of it, but the fact that he had left the revolver with Jane, together with the overwrought condition of his nerves, made him morbidly positive that she was threatened with some great danger. Perhaps even now she was attempting to defend herself against some savage man or beast. What were the thoughts of his strange captor, or guide? Clayton could only vaguely conjecture, but that he had heard the shot, and was in some manner affected by it, was quite evident, for he quickened his pace so appreciably that Clayton, stumbling blindly in his wake, was down a dozen times in as many minutes in a vain effort to keep pace with him, and soon was left hopelessly behind. Fearing that he would again be irretrievably lost, he called aloud to the wild man ahead of him, and in a moment had the satisfaction of seeing him drop lightly to his side from the branches above. For a moment Tarzan looked at the young man closely, as though undecided as to just what was best to do. Then, stooping down before Clayton, he motioned him to grasp him about the neck, and, with the white man upon his back, Tarzan took to the trees. The next few minutes the young Englishman never forgot. High into bending and swaying branches he was borne with what seemed to him incredible swiftness, while Tarzan chafed at the slowness of his progress. From one lofty branch the agile creature swung with Clayton through a dizzy arc to a neighboring tree, then for a hundred yards maybe the sure feet threaded a maze of interwoven limbs, balancing like a tight-rope walker high above the black depths of verdure beneath. From the first sensation of chilling fear, Clayton passed to one of keen admiration and envy of those giant muscles, and that wondrous instinct or knowledge which guided this forest god through the inky blackness of the night, as easily and safely as Clayton would have strolled a London street at high noon. Occasionally they would enter a spot where the foliage above was less dense, and the bright rays of the moon lit up before Clayton's wondering eyes the strange path they were traversing. At such times the man fairly caught his breath at sight of the horrid depths below them, for Tarzan took the easiest way which often led over a hundred feet above the earth. And yet, with all his seeming speed, Tarzan was in reality feeling his way with comparative slowness, searching constantly for limbs of adequate strength for the maintenance of this double weight. Presently they came to the clearing before the beach. Tarzan's quick ears had heard the strange sounds of Sabor's efforts to force her way through the lattice, and it seemed to Clayton that they dropped a straight hundred feet to earth, so quickly did Tarzan descend. Yet when they struck the ground it was with scarce a jar, and as Clayton released his hold on the ape-man, he saw him dart like a squirrel for the opposite side of the cabin. The Englishman sprang quickly after him, just in time to see the hindquarters of some huge animal about to disappear through the window of the cabin. As Jane opened her eyes to a realization of the imminent peril which threatened her, her brave young heart gave up at last its final vestige of hope. But then to her surprise she saw the huge animal being slowly drawn back through the window, and in the moonlight beyond she saw the heads and shoulders of two men. As Clayton rounded the corner of the cabin to behold the animal disappearing within, it was also to see the ape-man seize the long tail in both hands, and, bracing himself with his feet against the side of the cabin, throw all his mighty strength into the effort to draw the beast out of the interior. Clayton was quick to lend a hand, but the ape-man jabbered to him in a commanding and peremptory tone something which Clayton knew to be orders, though he could not understand them. At last, under their combined efforts, the great body was slowly dragged farther and farther outside the window, and then there came to Clayton's mind a dawning conception of the rash bravery of his companion's act. For a naked man to drag a shrieking, clawing man-eater forth from a window by the tail to save a strange white girl was indeed the last word in heroism. In so far as Clayton was concerned it was a very different matter, since the girl was not only of his own kind and race, 
but was the one woman in all the world whom he loved. Though he knew that the lioness would make short work of both of them, he pulled with a will to keep it from Jane Porter and then he recalled the battle between this man and the great black-maned lion which he had witnessed a short time before, and he commenced to feel more assurance. Tarzan was still issuing orders which Clayton could not understand. He was trying to tell the stupid white man to plunge his poisoned arrows into Sabor's back and sides, and to reach the savage heart with a long, thin hunting-knife that hung at Tarzan's hip, but the man would not understand and Tarzan did not dare release his hold to do the things himself, for he saw that the puny white man never could hold mighty Sabor alone for an instant. Slowly the lioness was emerging from the window. At last her shoulders were out. And then Clayton saw an incredible thing. Tarzan, racking his brains for some means to cope single-handed with the infuriated beast, had suddenly recalled his battle with Terkoz, and as the great shoulders came clear of the window, so that the lioness hung upon the sill only by her forepaws, Tarzan suddenly released his hold upon the brute. With the quickness of a striking rattler, he launched himself full upon Sabor's back, his strong young arms seeking and gaining a full half-Nelson upon the beast, as he had learned it that other day during his bloody wrestling victory over Tacos. With the roar the lioness turned completely over upon her back, falling fully upon her enemy, but the black-haired giant only closed tighter his hold. Pawing and tearing at earth and air, Sabor rolled and threw herself this way and that in an effort to dislodge this strange antagonist, but ever tighter and tighter drew the iron bands that were forcing her head lower and lower upon her tawny breast. Higher crept the steel forearms of the ape-man about the back of Sabor's neck. Weaker and weaker became the lioness's efforts. At last Clayton saw the immense muscles of Tarzan's shoulders and biceps leap into corded knots beneath the silver moonlight. There was a long, sustained, and supreme effort on the ape-man's part, and the vertebrae of Sabor's neck parted with a sharp snap. In an instant Tarzan was upon his feet, and for the second time that day Clayton heard the bull-ape's savage roar of victory. Then he heard Jane's agonized cry. "'Cecil! Mr. Clayton! Oh, what is it? What is it?' Running quickly to the cabin door, Clayton called out that all was right, and shouted to her to open the door. As quickly as she could she raised the great bar, and fairly dragged Clayton within. "'What was that awful noise?' she whispered, shrinking close to him. "'It was the cry of the kill from the throat of the man who has just saved your life, Miss Porter. Wait, I will fetch him so that you may thank him.' The frightened girl would not be left alone, so she accompanied Clayton to the side of the cabin where lay the dead body of the lioness. Tarzan of the Apes was gone. Clayton called several times, but there was no reply and so the two returned to the greater safety of the interior. "'What a frightful sound!' cried Jane. "'I shudder at the mere thought of it. Do not tell me that a human throat voiced that hideous and fearsome shriek.' "'But it did, Miss Porter,' replied Clayton. "'Or at least, if not a human throat, that of a forest god.' And then he told her of his experiences with this strange creature, of how twice the wild man had saved his life of the wondrous strength and agility and bravery of the brown skin and the handsome face. "'I cannot make it out at all,' he concluded. "'At first I thought he might be Tarzan of the Apes, but he neither speaks nor understands English, so that theory is untenable.' "'Well, whatever he may be,' cried the girl, "'we owe him our lives, and may God bless him and keep him in safety in his wild and savage jungle.' Amen, said Clayton fervently. For the good Lord's sake, ain't I dead? The two turned to see Esmeralda sitting upright upon the floor, her great eyes rolling from side to side as though she could not believe their testimony as to her whereabouts. And now, for Jane Porter, the reaction came, 
and she threw herself upon the bench, sobbing with hysterical laughter. End of chapter. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 16 Most Remarkable Several miles south of the cabin, upon a strip of sandy beach, stood two old men, arguing. Before them stretched the broad Atlantic. At their backs was the dark continent. Close around them loomed the impenetrable blackness of the jungle. Savage beasts roared and growled. Noises, hideous and weird, assailed their ears. They had wandered for miles in search of their camp, but always in the wrong direction. They were as hopelessly lost as though they had suddenly been transported to another world. At such a time, indeed, every fibre of their combined intellects must have been concentrated upon the vital question of the minute, the life-and-death question to them of retracing their steps to camp. Samuel T. Philander was speaking. "'But, my dear professor,' he was saying, "'I still maintain that but for the victories of Ferdinand and Isabella over the fifteenth-century Moors in Spain, the world would be to-day a thousand years in advance of where we now find ourselves. The Moors were essentially a tolerant, broad-minded, liberal race of agriculturalists, artisans, and merchants, the very type of people that has made possible such civilization as we find to-day in America and Europe, while the Spaniards—' "'Tut, tut, dear Mr. Philander,' interrupted Professor Porter. Their religion positively precluded the possibilities you suggest. Moslemism was, is, and always will be a blight on that scientific progress which has marked— Bless me, Professor, interjected Mr. Philander, who had turned his gaze toward the jungle. There seems to be someone approaching. Professor Archimedes Q. Porter turned in the direction indicated by the near-sighted Mr. Philander. "'Tut, tut, Mr. Philander,' he chided. "'How often must I urge you to seek that absolute concentration of your mental faculties which alone may permit you to bring to bear the highest powers of intellectuality upon the momentous problems which naturally fall to the lot of great minds? And now I find you guilty of a most flagrant breach of courtesy in interrupting my learned discourse to call attention to a mere quadruped of the genus Felis. As I was saying, Mr. Heavens, Professor, a lion? cried Mr. Philander, straining his weak eyes toward the dim figure outlined against the dark tropical underbrush. Yes, yes, Mr. Philander, if you insist upon employing slang in your discourse, a lion. But as I was saying, bless me, Professor again interrupted Mr. Philander. Permit me to suggest that doubtless the Moors who were conquered in the fifteenth century will continue in that most regrettable condition, for the time being at least, even though we postpone discussion of that world calamity uh, until we may attain the enchanting view of yon Felis Carnivora, which distance proverbially is credited with lending. In the meantime the lion had approached with quiet dignity to within ten paces of the two men, where he stood curiously watching them. The moonlight flooded the beach, and the strange group stood out in bold relief against the yellow sand. "'Most reprehensible! Most reprehensible!' exclaimed Professor Porter, with a faint trace of irritation in his voice. Never, Mr. Philander, never before in my life have I known one of these animals to be permitted to roam at large from its cage. I shall most certainly report this outrageous breach of ethics to the directors of the adjacent zoological garden. Quite right, Professor, agreed Mr. Philander, and the sooner it is done the better. Let us start now. Seizing the professor by the arm, Mr. Philander set off in the direction that would put the greatest distance between themselves and the lion. They had proceeded but a short distance when a backward glance revealed to the horrified gaze of Mr. Philander that the lion was following them. He tightened his grip upon the protesting professor and increased his speed. "'As I was saying, Mr. Philander,' repeated Professor Porter, Mr. Philander took another hasty glance rearward 
the lion also had quickened his gait and was doggedly maintaining an unvarying distance behind them he is following us gasped mr philander breaking into a run tut tut mr philander remonstrated the professor this unseemly haste is most unbecoming to men of letters what will our friends think of us who may chance to be upon the street and witness our frivolous antics pray let us proceed with more decorum mr philander stole another observation astern the lion was bounding along in easy leaps scarce five paces behind mr philander dropped the professor's arm and broke into a mad orgy of speed that would have done credit to any varsity track team as i was saying mr philander screamed professor porter as metaphorically speaking he himself threw her into high he too had caught a fleeting backward glimpse of cruel yellow eyes and half-open mouth within startling proximity of his person with streaming coat-tails and shiny silk hat professor archimedes q porter fled through the moonlight close upon the heels of mr samuel t philander before them a point of the jungle ran out toward a narrow promontory and it was for the haven of the trees he saw there that mr samuel t philander directed his prodigious leaps and bounds while from the shadows of the same spot peered two keen eyes in interested appreciation of the race it was tarzan of the apes who watched with face a grin this odd game of follow the leader he knew the two men were safe enough from attack in so far as the lion was concerned the very fact that Numa had foregone such easy prey at all convinced the wise forest craft of Tarzan that Numa's belly already was full. The lion might stalk them into hungry again, but the chances were that if not angered he would soon tire of the sport and slink away to his jungle lair. Really, the one great danger was that one of the men might stumble and fall and then the yellow devil would be upon him in a moment, and the joy of the kill would be too great a temptation to withstand. So Tarzan swung quickly to a lower limb in line with the approaching fugitives, and as Mr. Samuel T. Philander came panting and blowing beneath him, already too spent to struggle up to the safety of the limb, Tarzan reached down and, grasping him by the collar of his coat, yanked him to the limb by his side. Another moment brought the professor within the sphere of the friendly grip, and he too was drawn upward to safety just as the baffled Numa, with a roar, leaped to recover his vanishing quarry. For a moment the two men clung panting to the great branch, while Tarzan squatted with his back to the stem of the tree, watching them with mingled curiosity and amusement. It was the professor who first broke the silence i am deeply pained mr philander that you should have evinced such a paucity of manly courage in the presence of one of the lower orders and by your crass timidity have caused me to exert myself to such an unaccustomed degree in order that i might resume my discourse as i was saying mr philander when you interrupted me the moors professor archimedes q porter broke in mr philander in icy tones the time has arrived when patience becomes a crime and mayhem appears garbed in the mantle of virtue you have accused me of cowardice you have insinuated that you ran only to overtake me not to escape the clutches of the lion have a care professor archimedes q porter i am a desperate man goaded by long-suffering patience the worm will turn tut tut mr philander tut tut cautioned professor porter you forget yourself i forget nothing as yet professor archimedes q porter but believe me sir i am tottering on the verge of forgetfulness as to your exalted position in the world of science and your gray hairs the professor sat in silence for a few minutes and the darkness hid the grim smile that wreathed his wrinkled countenance presently he spoke look here skinny philander he said in belligerent tones if you are looking for a scrap peel off your coat and come on down on the ground and i'll punch your head just as i did sixty years ago in the alley back of porky evans barn ark gasped the astonished mr philander lordy how good that sounds when you're human ark i love you <laughs> 
but somehow it seems as though you had forgotten how to be human for the last twenty years. The professor reached out a thin, trembling old hand through the darkness until it found his old friend's shoulder. "'Forgive me, Skinny,' he said softly. "'It hasn't been quite twenty years, and God alone knows how hard I have tried to be human for Jane's sake, and yours too, since he took my other Jane away.' Another old hand stole up from Mr. Philander's side to clasp the one that lay upon his shoulder, and no other message could better have translated the one heart to the other. They did not speak for some minutes. The lion below them paced nervously back and forth. The third figure in the tree was hidden by the dense shadows near the stem. He too was silent, motionless as a graven image. "'You certainly pulled me up into this tree just in time,' said the professor at last. "'I want to thank you. You saved my life.' "'But I didn't pull you up here, professor,' said Mr. Philander. "'Bless me! The excitement of the moment quite caused me to forget that I myself was drawn up here by some outside agency. There must be someone or something in this tree with us.' "'Eh?' ejaculated Professor Porter. "'Are you quite positive, Mr. Philander?' "'Most positive, Professor,' replied Mr. Philander. "'And,' he added, "'I think we should thank the party. "'He may be sitting right next to you now, Professor.' "'Eh? What's that?' "'Tut-tut, Mr. Philander, tut-tut,' said Professor Porter, "'edging cautiously nearer to Mr. Philander.' Just then it occurred to Tarzan of the Apes that Numa had loitered beneath the tree for a sufficient length of time, so he raised his young head toward the heavens, and there rang out upon the terrified ears of the two old men the awful warning challenge of the anthropoid. The two friends, huddling and trembling in their precarious position on the limb, saw the great lion halt in his restless pacing as the blood-curdling cry smote his ears, and then slink quickly into the jungle to be instantly lost to view. "'Even the lion trembles in fear,' whispered Mr. Philander. "'Most remarkable, most remarkable,' murmured Professor Porter, clutching frantically at Mr. Philander to regain the balance which the sudden fright had so perilously endangered. Unfortunately for them both, Mr. Philander's centre of equilibrium was at that very moment hanging upon the ragged edge of nothing so that it needed but the gentle impetus supplied by the additional weight of Professor Porter's body to topple the devoted secretary from the limb. For a moment they swayed uncertainly, and then, with mingled and most unscholarly shrieks, they pitched headlong from the tree, locked in frenzied embrace. It was quite some moments ere either moved, for both were positive that any such attempt would reveal so many breaks and fractures as to make further progress impossible. At length Professor Porter made an attempt to move one leg. To his surprise it responded to his will as in days gone by. He now drew up its mate and stretched it forth again. "'Most remarkable, most remarkable,' he murmured. "'Thank God, Professor,' whispered Mr. Philander fervently. "'You are not dead, then?' "'Tut, tut, Mr. Philander, tut, tut.' cautioned Professor Porter. I do not know with accuracy as yet. With infinite solicitude, Professor Porter wiggled his right arm. Joy! It was intact. Breathlessly he waved his left arm above his prostrate body. It waved. Most remarkable, most remarkable, he said. To whom are you signaling, Professor? asked Mr. Philander in an excited tone. Professor Porter deigned to make no response to this puerile inquiry. Instead he raised his head gently from the ground, nodding it back and forth a half-dozen times. "'Most remarkable,' he breathed. "'It remains intact.' Mr. Philander had not moved from where he had fallen. He had not dared the attempt. How indeed could one move when one's arms and legs and back were broken? One eye was buried in the soft loam, the other, rolling sidewise, was fixed in awe upon the strange gyrations of Professor Porter. "'How sad!' exclaimed Mr. Philander, half aloud. "'Concussion of the brain, superinducing total mental aberration. How very sad indeed! 
and for one still so young. Professor Porter rolled over upon his stomach. Gingerly he bowed his back until he resembled a huge tomcat in proximity to a yelping dog. Then he sat up and felt of various portions of his anatomy. "'They are all here!' he exclaimed. "'Most remarkable!' Whereupon he arose, and bending a scathing glance upon the still prostrate form of Mr. Samuel T. Philander, he said, "'Tut, tut, Mr. Philander, this is no time to indulge in slothful ease. We must be up and doing.' Mr. Philander lifted his other eye out of the mud and gazed in speechless rage at Professor Porter. Then he attempted to rise nor could there have been any more surprise than he when his efforts were immediately crowned with marked success. He was still bursting with rage, however, at the cruel injustice of Professor Porter's insinuation, and was on the point of rendering a tart rejoinder when his eyes fell upon a strange figure, standing a few paces away, scrutinizing them intently. Professor Porter had recovered his shiny silk hat, which he had brushed carefully upon the sleeve of his coat and replaced upon his head. When he saw Mr. Flander pointing to something behind him, he turned to behold a giant, naked but for a loincloth and a few metal ornaments, standing motionless before him. "'Good evening, sir,' said the professor, lifting his hat. For reply the giant motioned them to follow him, and set off up the beach in the direction from which they had recently come. "'I think it is the better part of discretion to follow him,' said Mr. Philander. "'Tut, tut, Mr. Philander,' returned the professor. "'A short time since you were advancing a most logical argument in substantiation of your theory that camp lay directly south of us. I was sceptical, but you finally convinced me. So now I am positive that toward the south we must travel to reach our friends. Therefore I shall continue south.' "'But, Professor Porter, this man may know better than either of us. He seems to be indigenous to this part of the world. Let us at least follow him for a short distance.' "'Tut, tut, Mr. Philander,' repeated the Professor. "'I am a difficult man to convince, but when once convinced my decision is unalterable. I shall continue in the proper direction, if I have to circumambulate the continent of Africa to reach my destination.' Further argument was interrupted by Tarzan, who, seeing that these strange men were not following him, had returned to their side. Again he beckoned to them, but still they stood in argument. Presently the ape-man lost patience with their stupid ignorance. He grasped the frightened Mr. Philander by the shoulder, and before that worthy gentleman knew whether he was being killed or merely maimed for life, Tarzan had tied one end of his rope securely about Mr. Philander's neck. "'Tut, tut, Mr. Philander,' remonstrated Professor Porter. "'It is most unbeseeming in you to submit to such indignities.' But scarcely were the words out of his mouth ere he, too, had been seized and securely bound by the neck with the same rope. Then Tarzan set off toward the north, leading the now thoroughly frightened Professor and his secretary. In deathly silence they proceeded for what seemed hours to the two tired and hopeless old men, but presently, as they topped a little rise of ground, they were overjoyed to see the cabin lying before them, not a hundred yards distant. Here Tarzan released them, and, pointing toward the little building, vanished into the jungle beside them. "'Most remarkable! Most remarkable!' gasped the professor. "'But you see, Mr. Philander, that I was quite right, as usual.' and but for your stubborn willfulness we should have escaped a series of most humiliating, not to say dangerous, accidents. Pray allow yourself to be guided by a more mature and practical mind hereafter when in need of wise counsel. Mr. Samuel T. Philander was too much relieved at the happy outcome to their adventure to take umbrage at the professor's cruel fling. Instead he grasped his friend's arm and hastened him forward in the direction of the cabin. It was a much-relieved party of castaways that found itself once more united. Don discovered them still recounting their various adventures, and speculating upon the identity of the strange guardian and protector they had found on this savage shore. 
Esmeralda was positive that it was none other than an angel of the Lord, sent down especially to watch over them. "'Had you seen him devour the raw meat of the lion, Esmeralda,' laughed Clayton, "'you would have thought him a very material angel.' "'There was nothing heavenly about his voice,' said Jane Porter, with a little shudder at recollection of the awful roar which had followed the killing of the lioness. "'Nor did it precisely comport with my preconceived ideas of the dignity of divine messengers,' remarked Professor Porter. "'But when the, um, gentlemen tied two highly respectable and erudite scholars neck to neck, and dragged them through the jungle as though they had been cows—' End of chapter Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 17 Burials As it was now quite light, the party, none of whom had eaten or slept since the previous morning, began to bestir themselves to prepare food. The mutineers of the Arrow had landed a small supply of dried meats, canned soups, and vegetables, crackers, flour, tea, and coffee for the five they had marooned and these were hurriedly drawn upon to satisfy the craving of long-famished appetites. The next task was to make the cabin habitable, and to this end it was decided to at once remove the gruesome relics of the tragedy which had taken place there on some bygone day. Professor Porter and Mr. Philander were deeply interested in examining the skeletons. The two larger, they stated, had belonged to a male and female of one of the higher white races. The smallest skeleton was given but passing attention, as its location, in the crib, left no doubt as to its having been the infant offspring of this unhappy couple. As they were preparing the skeleton of the man for burial, Clayton discovered a massive ring which had evidently encircled the man's finger at the time of his death, for one of the slender bones of the hand still lay within the golden bauble. Picking it up to examine it, Clayton gave a cry of astonishment for the ring bore the crest of the house of Greystoke. At the same time Jane discovered the books in the cupboard, and on opening the fly-leaf of one of them saw the name John Clayton, London. In a second book which she hurriedly examined was the single name, Greystoke. "'Why, Mr. Clayton,' she cried, "'what does this mean? Here are the names of some of your own people in these books.' "'And here,' he replied gravely, is the great ring of the house of Greystoke, which has been lost since my uncle, John Clayton, the former Lord Greystoke, disappeared, presumably lost at sea. "'But how do you account for these things being here, in this savage African jungle?' exclaimed the girl. "'There is but one way to account for it, Miss Porter,' said Clayton. "'The late Lord Greystoke was not drowned.' He died here in this cabin, and this poor thing upon the floor is all that is mortal of him." "'Then this must have been Lady Greystoke,' said Jane reverently, indicating the poor mass of bones upon the bed. "'The beautiful Lady Alice,' replied Clayton, "'of whose many virtues and remarkable personal charms I often have heard my mother and father speak. Poor woman,' he murmured sadly. With deep reverence and solemnity the bodies of the late Lord and Lady Greystoke were buried beside their little African cabin, and between them was placed the tiny skeleton of the baby of Kayla, the ape. As Mr. Philander was placing the frail bones of the infant in a bit of sailcloth, he examined the skull minutely. Then he called Professor Porter to his side, and the two argued in low tones for several minutes. "'Most remarkable! Most remarkable!' said Professor Porter. "'Bless me,' said Mr. Philander. "'We must acquaint Mr. Clayton with our discovery at once.' "'Tut-tut, Mr. Philander, tut-tut,' remonstrated Professor Archimedes Q. Porter. "'Let the dead past bury its dead.' And so the white-haired old man repeated the burial service over this strange grave, while his four companions stood with bowed and uncovered heads about him. From the trees Tarzan of the Apes watched the solemn ceremony, but most of all he watched the sweet face and graceful figure of Jane Porter. 
In his savaged, untutored breast new emotions were stirring. He could not fathom them. He wondered why he felt so great an interest in these people, why he had gone to such pains to save the three men. But he did not wonder why he had torn Sabor from the tender flesh of the strange girl. Surely the men were stupid and ridiculous and cowardly. Even Manu, the monkey, was more intelligent than they. If these were creatures of his own kind, he was doubtful if his past pride in blood was warranted. But the girl? Ah, that was a different matter. He did not reason here. He knew that she was created to be protected, and that he was created to protect her. He wondered why they had dug a great hole in the ground merely to bury dry bones. Surely there was no sense in that. No one wanted to steal dry bones. Had there been meat upon them, he could have understood, for thus alone might one keep his meat from Dango, the hyena, and the other robbers of the jungle. When the grave had been filled with earth, the little party turned back toward the cabin, and Esmeralda, still weeping copiously for the two she had never heard of before today, and who had been dead twenty years, chanced to glance toward the harbor. Instantly her tears ceased. "'Look at them low-down white trash out there!' she trilled, pointing toward the arrow. "'They all's a-desecrating us, right here on this here perverted island!' And, sure enough, the arrow was being worked toward the open sea, slowly, through the harbor's entrance. "'They promised to leave us firearms and ammunition,' said Clayton. "'The merciless beasts!' "'It is the work of that fellow they call Snipes, I'm sure,' said Jane." King was a scoundrel, but he had a little sense of humanity. If they had not killed him, I know that he would have seen it that we were properly provided for before they left us to our fate. "'I regret that they did not visit us before sailing,' said Professor Porter. "'I had proposed requesting them to leave the treasure with us, as I shall be a ruined man if that is lost.' Jane looked at her father sadly. "'Never mind, dear,' she said. "'It wouldn't have done any good, because it is solely for the treasure that they killed their officers and landed us upon this awful shore.' "'Tut-tut, child, tut-tut,' replied Professor Porter. "'You are a good child, but inexperienced in practical matters.' And Professor Porter turned and walked slowly away towards the jungle, his hands clasped beneath his long coat-tails and his eyes bent upon the ground. His daughter watched him with a pathetic smile upon her lips, and then turning to Mr. Philander she whispered, "'Please don't let him wander off again as he did yesterday. We depend upon you, you know, to keep a close watch upon him.' "'He becomes more difficult to handle each day,' replied Mr. Philander, with a sigh and a shake of his head. I presume he is now off to report to the directors of the zoo that one of their lions was at large last night. Oh, Miss Jane, you don't know what I have to contend with. Yes, I do, Mr. Philander, but while we all love him, you alone are best fitted to manage him, for regardless of what he may say to you, he respects your great learning, and therefore has immense confidence in your judgment. The poor dear cannot differentiate between erudition and wisdom. Mr. Philander, with a mildly puzzled expression on his face, turned to pursue Professor Porter, and in his mind he was revolving the question of whether he should feel complimented or aggrieved at Miss Porter's rather backhanded compliment. Tarzan had seen the consternation depicted upon the faces of the little group as they witnessed the departure of the arrow. So, as the ship was a wonderful novelty to him in addition, he determined to hasten out to the point of land at the north of the harbor's mouth and obtain a nearer view of the boat, as well as to learn, if possible, the direction of its flight. Swinging through the trees with great speed, he reached the point only a moment after the ship had passed out of the harbor, so that he obtained an excellent view of the wonders of this strange floating house. There were some twenty men running hither and thither about the deck, pulling and hauling on ropes. A light land breeze was blowing, and the ship had been worked through the harbor's mouth under scant sail, 
but now that they had cleared the point every available shred of canvas was being spread that she might stand out to sea as handily as possible. Tarzan watched the graceful movements of the ship in rapt admiration and longed to be aboard her. Presently his keen eyes caught the faintest suspicion of smoke on the far northern horizon, and he wondered over the cause of such a thing out on the great water. About the same time the lookout on the arrow must have discerned it, for in a few minutes Tarzan saw the sails being shifted and shortened. The ship came about, and presently he knew that she was beating back toward land. A man at the bows was constantly heaving into the sea a rope to the end of which a small object was fastened. Tarzan wondered what the purpose of this action might be. At last the ship came up directly into the wind, the anchor was lowered, down came the sails. There was great scurrying about on deck. A boat was lowered, and in it a great chest was placed. Then a dozen sailors bent to the oars and pulled rapidly toward the point where Tarzan crouched in the branches of a tree. In the stern of the boat, as it drew nearer, Tarzan saw the rat-faced man. It was but a few minutes later that the boat touched the beach. The men jumped out and lifted the great chest to the sand. They were on the north side of the point, so that their presence was concealed from those at the cabin. The men argued angrily for a moment. Then the rat-faced one, with several companions, ascended the low bluff on which stood the tree that concealed Tarzan. They looked about for several minutes. "'Here is a good place,' said the rat-faced sailor, indicating a spot beneath Tarzan's tree. "'It is as good as any,' replied one of his companions. "'If they catch us with the treasure aboard, it will all be confiscated anyway.' We might as well bury it here in that chance that some of us will escape the gallows to come back and enjoy it later. The rat-faced one now called to the men who had remained at the boat, and they came slowly up the bank carrying picks and shovels. Hurry, you! cried Snipes. Stow it! retorted one of the men in a surly tone. You're no admiral, you damn shrimp! I'm captain here, though. I'll have you understand, you swab! shrieked Snipes with a volley of frightful oaths. "'Steady, boys,' cautioned one of the men who had not spoken before. "'It ain't going to get us nothing but fighting amongst ourselves.' "'Right enough,' replied the sailor who had resented Snipes' autocratic tones. "'But it ain't a-going to get nobody nothing to put on airs in this bloomin' company, neither.' "'You fellas dig here,' said Snipes, indicating a spot beneath the tree. And while you're digging, Peter can be a making a map of the location so's we can find it again. You, Tom, and Bill, take a couple more down and fetch up the chest. What are you a going to do? Asked he of the previous altercation. Just boss. Get busy there, growled Snipes. You didn't think your captain was a going to dig with a shovel, did you? The men all looked up angrily. None of them liked Snipes, and this disagreeable show of authority since he had murdered King, the real head and ringleader of the mutineers, had only added fuel to the flames of their hatred. "'Do you mean to say that you don't intend to take a shovel and lend a hand with this work? Your shoulder's not hurt so all-fired bad as that,' said Tarrant, the sailor who had before spoken. "'Not by a damn sight!' replied Snipes, fingering the butt of his revolver nervously. "'Then by God,' replied Tarrant, "'if you won't take a shovel, you'll take a pickaxe.' With the words he raised his pick above his head, and with a mighty blow he buried the point in Snipes' brain. For a moment the men stood silently looking at the result of their fellow's grim humor. Then one of them spoke. "'Serve this skunk jolly well right,' he said. One of the others commenced to ply his pick to the ground. The soil was soft, and he threw aside the pick and grasped a shovel. Then the others joined him. There was no further comment on the killing, but the men worked in a better frame of mind than they had since Snipes had assumed command. When they had a trench of ample size to bury the chest, Tarrant suggested that they enlarge it and inter Snipes' body on top of the chest. It might help fool any as happened to be digging hereabouts. abouts. 
he explained. The others saw the cunning of the suggestion, and so the trench was lengthened to accommodate the corpse, and in the center a deeper hole was excavated for the box, which was first wrapped in sailcloth, and then lowered to its place, which brought its top about a foot below the bottom of the grave. Earth was shoveled in and tramped down about the chest, until the bottom of the grave showed level and uniform. Two of the men rolled the rat-faced corpse unceremoniously into the grave, after first stripping it of its weapons and various other articles which the several members of the party coveted for their own. They then filled the grave with earth, and tramped upon it until it would hold no more. The balance of the loose earth was thrown far and wide, and a mass of dead undergrowth spread in as natural a manner as possible over the new-made grave to obliterate all signs of the ground having been disturbed. Their work done, the sailors returned to the small boat, and pulled off rapidly toward the arrow. The breeze had increased considerably, and as the smoke upon the horizon was now plainly discernible in considerable volume, the mutineers lost no time in getting under full sail and bearing away toward the southwest. Tarzan, an interested spectator of all that had taken place, sat speculating on the strange actions of these peculiar creatures. Men were indeed more foolish and more cruel than the beasts of the jungle. How fortunate was he who lived in the peace and security of the great forest! Tarzan wondered what the chest they had buried contained. If they did not want it, why did they not merely throw it into the water? That would have been much easier. Ah, he thought, but they do want it. They have hidden it here because they intend returning for it later. Tarzan dropped to the ground and commenced to examine the earth about the excavation. He was looking to see if these creatures had dropped anything which he might like to own. Soon he discovered a spade hidden by the underbrush which they had laid upon the grave. He seized it and attempted to use it as he had seen the sailors do. It was awkward work and hurt his bare feet, but he persevered until he had partially uncovered the body. This he dragged from the grave and laid to one side. Then he continued digging until he had unearthed the chest. This also he dragged to the side of the corpse. Then he filled in the smaller hole below the grave, replaced the body and the earth around and above it, covered it over with underbrush, and returned to the chest. Four sailors had sweated beneath the burden of its weight. Tarzan of the apes picked it up as though it had been an empty packing case, and with the spade slung to his back by a piece of rope, carried it off into the densest part of the jungle. He could not well negotiate the trees with his awkward burden, but he kept to the trails and so made fairly good time. For several hours he traveled a little north of east until he came to an impenetrable wall of matted and tangled vegetation. Then he took to the lower branches, and in another fifteen minutes he emerged into the amphitheater of the apes, where they met in council, or to celebrate the rites of the dum-dum. Near the center of the clearing, and not far from the drum, or altar, he commenced to dig. This was harder work than turning up the freshly excavated earth at the grave, but Tarzan of the apes was persevering, and so he kept at his labor, until he was rewarded by seeing a hole sufficiently deep to receive the chest, and effectually hide it from view. Why had he gone to all this labor without knowing the value of the contents of the chest? Tarzan of the apes had a man's figure and a man's brain, but he was an ape by training and environment. His brain told him that the chest contained something valuable, or the man would not have hidden it. His training had taught him to imitate whatever was new and unusual, and now the natural curiosity, which is as common to men as to apes, prompted him to open the chest and examine its contents. But the heavy lock and massive iron bands baffled both his cunning and his immense strength, so that he was compelled to bury the chest without having his curiosity satisfied. By the time Tarzan had hunted his way back to the vicinity of the cabin, feeding as he went, it was quite dark. Within the little building a light was burning, for Clayton had found an unopened tin of oil which had stood intact for twenty years, a part of the supplies left with the Claytons by Black Michael. The lamps also were still usable, 
and thus the interior of the cabin appeared as bright as day to the astonished Tarzan. He had often wondered at the exact purpose of the lamps. His reading and the pictures had told him what they were, but he had no idea of how they could be made to produce the wondrous sunlight that some of his pictures had portrayed them as diffusing upon all surrounding objects. As he approached the window nearest the door, he saw that the cabin had been divided into two rooms by a rough partition of boughs and sailcloth. In the front room were the three men, the two older deep in argument, while the younger, tilted back against the wall on an improvised stool, was deeply engrossed in reading one of Tarzan's books. Tarzan was not particularly interested in the men, however, so he sought the other window. There was the girl. How beautiful her features! How delicate her snowy skin! She was writing at Tarzan's own table beneath the window. Upon a pile of grasses at the far side of the room lay the negress, asleep. For an hour Tarzan feasted his eyes upon her while she wrote. How he longed to speak to her, but he dared not attempt it, for he was convinced that, like the young man, she would not understand him, and he feared, too, that he might frighten her away. At length she arose, leaving her manuscript upon the table. She went to the bed upon which had been spread several layers of soft grasses. These she rearranged. Then she loosened the soft mass of golden hair which crowned her head. Like a shimmering waterfall turned to burnished metal by a dying sun, it fell about her oval face. In waving lines, below her waist it tumbled. Tarzan was spellbound. Then she extinguished the lamp, and all within the cabin was wrapped in Sumerian darkness. Still Tarzan watched. Creeping close beneath the window, he waited, listening, for half an hour. At last he was rewarded by the sounds of the regular breathing within which denotes sleep. Cautiously he intruded his hand between the meshes of the lattice until his whole arm was within the cabin. Carefully he felt upon the desk. At last he grasped the manuscript upon which Jane Porter had been writing, and as cautiously withdrew his arm and hand, holding the precious treasure. Tarzan folded the sheets into a small parcel which he tucked into the quiver with his arrows. Then he melted away into the jungle, as softly and as noiselessly as a shadow. End of chapter Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 18 The Jungle Toll Early the next morning Tarzan awoke, and his first thought of the new day, as the last of yesterday, was of the wonderful writing which lay hidden in his quiver. Hurriedly he brought it forth, hoping against hope that he could read what the beautiful white girl had written there the preceding evening. At the first glance he suffered a bitter disappointment. Never before had he so yearned for anything as now he did for the ability to interpret a message from that golden-haired divinity who had come so suddenly and so unexpectedly into his life. What did it matter if the message were not intended for him? It was an expression of her thoughts, and that was sufficient for Tarzan of the Apes. And now to be baffled by strange, uncouth characters the like of which he had never seen before. Why, they even tipped in the opposite direction from all that he had ever examined, either in printed books or the difficult script of the few letters he had found. Even the little bugs of the black book were familiar friends, though their arrangement meant nothing to him, but these bugs were new and unheard of. For twenty minutes he pored over them, when suddenly they commenced to take familiar, though distorted, shapes. Ah, they were his old friends, but badly crippled. Then he began to make out a word here and a word there. His heart leaped for joy. He could read it, and he would. In another half-hour he was progressing rapidly, and but for an exceptional word now and again he found it very plain sailing. Here is what he read. West coast of Africa, about ten degrees south latitude, so Mr. Clayton says, February 3, question mark, 1909. Dearest Hazel, 
It seems foolish to write you a letter that you may never see, but I simply must tell somebody of our awful experiences since we sailed from Europe on the ill-fated arrow. If we never return to civilization, as now seems only too likely, this will at least prove a brief record of the events which led up to our final fate, whatever it may be. As you know, we were supposed to have set out upon a scientific expedition to the Congo. Papa was presumed to entertain some wondrous theory of an unthinkably ancient civilization, the remains of which lay buried somewhere in the Congo Valley. But after we were well under sail, the truth came out. It seems that an old bookworm who has a book and curio shop in Baltimore discovered between the leaves of a very old Spanish manuscript a letter written in 1550 detailing the adventures of a crew of mutineers of a Spanish galleon bound from Spain to South America with a vast treasure of doubloons and pieces of eight, I suppose, for they certainly sound weird in piratey. The writer had been one of the crew, and the letter was to his son, who was, at the very time the letter was written, master of a Spanish merchantman. Many years had elapsed since the events the letter narrated had transpired, and the old man had become a respected citizen of an obscure Spanish town, but the love of gold was still so strong upon him that he risked all to acquaint his son with the means of obtaining fabulous wealth for them both. The writer told how, when but a week out from Spain, the crew had mutinied and murdered every officer and man who opposed them, but they defeated their own ends by this very act, for there was none left competent to navigate a ship at sea. They were blown hither and thither for two months, until, sick and dying of scurvy, starvation, and thirst, they had been wrecked on a small islet. The galleon was washed high upon the beach where she went to pieces, but not before the survivors, who numbered but ten souls, had rescued one of the great chests of treasure. This they buried well up on the island, and for three years they lived there in constant hope of being rescued. One by one they sickened and died, until only one man was left, the writer of the letter. The men had built a boat from the wreckage of the galleon, but having no idea where the island was located, they had not dared to put it to sea. When all were dead except himself, however, the awful loneliness so weighed upon the mind of the sole survivor that he could endure it no longer, and choosing to risk death upon the open sea rather than madness on the lonely isle, he set sail in his little boat after nearly a year of solitude. Fortunately he sailed due north, and within a week was in the track of the Spanish merchantmen plying between the West Indies and Spain, and was picked up by one of these vessels homeward bound. The story he told was merely one of shipwreck in which all but a few had perished, the balance, except himself, dying after they reached the island. He did not mention the mutiny or the chest of buried treasure. The master of the merchantmen assured him that from the position at which they had picked him up, and the prevailing winds for the past week, he could have been on no other island than one of the Cape Verde group, which lie off the west coast of Africa in about sixteen or seventeen degrees north latitude. His letter described the island minutely as well as the location of the treasure, and was accompanied by the crudest, funniest little old map you ever saw, with trees and rocks all marked by scrawly X's to show the exact spot where the treasure had been buried. When Papa explained the real nature of the expedition, my heart sank, for I know so well how visionary and impractical the poor dear has always been that I feared that he had again been duped especially when he told me he had paid a thousand dollars for the letter and map. To add to my distress, I learned that he had borrowed ten thousand dollars more from Robert Candler, and had given his notes for the amount. Mr. Candler had asked for no security, and you know, dearie, what that will mean for me if Papa cannot meet them. Oh, how I detest that man! We all tried to look on the bright side of things, but Mr. Philander and Mr. Clayton he joined us in London just for the adventure, both felt as skeptical as I. Well, to make a long story short, we found the island and the treasure, a great iron-bound oak chest, 
wrapped in many layers of oiled sailcloth, and as strong and firm as when it had been buried nearly two hundred years ago. It was simply filled with gold coin, and was so heavy that four men bent underneath its weight. The horrid thing seems to bring nothing but murder and misfortune to those who have anything to do with it. For three days after we sailed from the Cape Verde Islands, our own crew mutinied, and killed every one of their officers. Oh, it was the most terrifying experience one could imagine. I cannot even write of it. They were going to kill us, too, but one of them, the leader, named King, would not let them, and so they sailed south along the coast to a lonely spot where they found a good harbor, and here they landed and have left us. They sailed away with the treasure today, but Mr. Clayton says they will meet with a fate similar to the mutineers of the ancient galleon, because King, the only man aboard who knew aught of navigation, was murdered on the beach by one of the men the day we landed. I wish you could know Mr. Clayton. He is the dearest fellow imaginable, and unless I am mistaken he has fallen very much in love with me. He is the only son of Lord Greystoke, and some day will inherit the title and estates. In addition, he is wealthy in his own right, but the fact that he is going to be an English lord makes me very sad. You know what my sentiments have always been relative to American girls who married titled foreigners. Oh, if he were only a plain American gentleman! But it isn't his fault, poor fellow, and in everything except birth he would do credit to my country, and that is the greatest compliment I know how to pay any man. We have had the most weird experiences since we were landed here. Papa and Mr. Philander lost in the jungle, and chased by a real lion. Mr. Clayton lost, and attacked twice by wild beasts. Esmeralda and I cornered in an old cabin by a perfectly awful man-eating lioness. Oh, it was simply terrifical, as Esmeralda would say. But the strangest part of it all is the wonderful creature who rescued us. I have not seen him but Mr. Clayton and Papa and Mr. Philander have, and they say that he is a perfectly godlike white man, tanned to a dusky brown, with the strength of a wild elephant, the agility of a monkey, and the bravery of a lion. He speaks no English, and vanishes as quickly and as mysteriously after he has performed some valorous deed, as though he were a disembodied spirit. Then we have another weird neighbor, who printed a beautiful sign in English, and tacked it on the door of his cabin, which we have preempted, warning us to destroy none of his belongings, and signing himself Tarzan of the Apes. We have never seen him, though we think he is about, for one of the sailors who was going to shoot Mr. Clayton in the back received a spear in his shoulder from some unseen hand in the jungle. The sailors left us but a meager supply of food, so, as we have only a single revolver with but three cartridges left in it, we do not know how we can procure meat, though Mr. Philander says that we can exist indefinitely on the wild fruit and nuts which abound in the jungle. I am very tired now, so I shall go to my funny bed of grasses which Mr. Clayton gathered for me, but will add to this from day to day as things happen. Lovingly, Jane Porter to Hazel Strong, Baltimore, Maryland. Tarzan sat in a brown study for a long time after he finished reading the letter. It was filled with so many new and wonderful things that his brain was in a whirl as he attempted to digest them all. So they did not know that he was Tarzan of the Apes. He would tell them. In his tree he had constructed a rude shelter of leaves and boughs, beneath which, protected from the rain, he had placed a few treasures brought from the cabin. Among these were some pencils. He took one, and beneath Jane Porter's signature he wrote, I am Tarzana of the Apes. He thought that would be sufficient. Later he would return the letter to the cabin. In the matter of food, thought Tarzan, they had no need to worry. He would provide, and he did. The next morning Jane found her missing letter in the exact spot from which it had disappeared two nights before. She was mystified, but when she saw the printed words beneath her signature, she felt a cold, clammy chill run up her spine. She showed the letter, or rather the last sheet with the signature, to Clayton. 
"'And to think,' she said, "'that uncanny thing was probably watching me all the time that I was writing. Ooh, it makes me shudder just to think of it.' "'But he must be friendly,' reassured Clayton, "'for he has returned your letter, nor did he offer to harm you, "'and unless I am mistaken he left a very substantial memento of his friendship "'outside the cabin door last night, "'for I just found the carcass of a wild boar there as I came out.' "'From then on scarcely a day passed that did not bring its offering of game or other food. "'Sometimes it was a young deer, again a quantity of strange cooked food, cassava cakes pilfered from the village of Mabonga, or a boar, or leopard, and once a lion. Tarzan derived the greatest pleasure of his life in hunting meat for these strangers. It seemed to him that no pleasure on earth could compare with laboring for the welfare and protection of the beautiful white girl. Some day he would venture into the camp in daylight and talk with these people through the medium of the little bugs which were familiar to them and to Tarzan but he found it difficult to overcome the timidity of the wild thing of the forest, and so day followed day without seeing a fulfillment of his good intentions. The party in the camp, emboldened by familiarity, wandered farther and yet farther into the jungle in search of nuts and fruit. Scarcely a day passed that did not find Professor Porter straying in his preoccupied indifference towards the jaws of death. Mr. Samuel T. Philander, never what one might call robust, was worn to the shadow of a shadow through the ceaseless worry and mental distraction resultant from his Herculean efforts to safeguard the professor. A month passed. Tarzan had finally determined to visit the camp by daylight. It was early afternoon. Clayton had wandered to the point at the harbor's mouth to look for passing vessels. Here he kept a great mass of wood, high-piled, ready to be ignited as a signal, should a steamer or a sail top the far horizon. Professor Porter was wandering along the beach south of the camp with Mr. Philander at his elbow, urging him to turn his steps back before the two became again the sport of some savage beast. The others gone, Jane and Esmeralda had wandered into the jungle to gather fruit, and in their search were led farther and farther from the cabin. Tarzan waited in silence before the door of the little house until they should return. His thoughts were of the beautiful white girl. They were always of her now. He wondered if she would fear him, and the thought all but caused him to relinquish his plan. He was rapidly becoming impatient for her return, that he might feast his eyes upon her and be near her, perhaps touch her. The ape-man knew no god but he was as near to worshipping his divinity as mortal man ever comes to worship. While he waited he passed the time printing a message to her, whether he intended giving it to her he himself could not have told, but he took infinite pleasure in seeing his thoughts expressed in print, in which he was not so uncivilized after all. He wrote, I am Tarzan of the apes. I want you. I am yours. You are mine. We live here together always in my house. I will bring you the best of fruits, the tenderest deer, the finest meats that roam the jungle. I will hunt for you. I am the greatest of the jungle fighters. I will fight for you. I am the mightiest of the jungle fighters. You are Jane Porter. I saw it in your letter. When you see this you will know that it is for you and that Tarzan of the apes loves you. As he stood, straight as a young Indian, by the door, waiting after he had finished the message, there came to his keen ears a familiar sound. It was the passing of a great ape through the lower branches of the forest. For an instant he listened intently, and then from the jungle came the agonized scream of a woman, and Tarzan of the apes, dropping his first love letter upon the ground, shot like a panther into the forest. Clayton also heard the scream, and Professor Porter and Mr. Philander, and in a few minutes they came panting to the cabin, calling out to each other a volley of excited questions as they approached. A glance within confirmed their worst fears. Jane and Esmeralda were not there. Instantly Clayton, followed by the two old men, plunged into the jungle, calling the girl's name aloud. 
for half an hour they stumbled on, until Clayton, by merest chance, came upon the prostrate form of Esmeralda. He stopped beside her, feeling for her pulse, and then listening for her heartbeats. She lived. He shook her. Esmeralda! he shrieked in her ear. Esmeralda, for God's sake, where is Miss Porter? What has happened? Esmeralda! Slowly Esmeralda opened her eyes. She saw Clayton. She saw the jungle about her. Oh, Gabriel! she screamed and fainted again. By this time Professor Porter and Mr. Philander had come up. "'What shall we do, Mr. Clayton?' asked the old professor. "'Where shall we look? God could not have been so cruel as to take my little girl away from me now.' "'We must arouse Esmeralda first, replied Clayton. "'She can tell us what has happened.' "'Esmeralda!' he cried again, shaking the black woman roughly by the shoulder. "'Oh, Gabrielle, I want to die!' cried the poor woman, but with eyes fast closed. "'Let me die, dear Lord, don't let me see that awful face again!' "'Come, come, Esmeralda!' cried Clayton. "'The Lord isn't here, it's Mr. Clayton. Open your eyes!' Esmeralda did as she was bade. "'Oh, Gabrielle, thank the Lord!' she said. "'Where's Miss Porter? What happened?' questioned Clayton. "'Ain't Miss Jane here?' cried Esmeralda, sitting up with wonderful celerity for one of her bulk. "'Oh, Lord, now I remember! It must have took her away!' And the negress commenced to sob and wail her lamentations. "'What took her away?' cried Professor Porter. "'A great big giant all covered with hair!' "'A gorilla, Esmeralda?' questioned Mr. Philander and the three men scarcely breathed as he voiced the horrible thought. "'I thought it was the devil, but I guess it must have been one of them gorillophants. Oh, my poor baby, my poor little honey!' And again Esmeralda broke into uncontrollable sobbing. Clayton immediately began to look about for tracks, but he could find nothing save a confusion of trampled grasses in the close vicinity and his woodcraft was too meager for the translation of what he did see. All the balance of the day they sought through the jungle, but as night drew on they were forced to give up in despair and hopelessness, for they did not even know in what direction the thing had borne Jane. It was long after dark ere they reached the cabin, and a sad and grief-stricken party it was that sat silently within the little structure. Professor Porter finally broke the silence. His tones were no longer those of the erudite pedant, theorizing upon the abstract and the unknowable, but those of the man of action, determined, but tinged also by a note of indescribable hopelessness and grief, which wrung an answering pang from Clayton's heart. "'I shall lie down now,' said the old man, "'and try to sleep. Early to-morrow, as soon as it is light, I shall take what food I can carry, and continue the search until I have found Jane. I will not return without her." His companions did not reply at once. Each was immersed in his own sorrowful thoughts, and each knew, as did the old professor, what the last words meant. Professor Porter would never return from the jungle. At length Clayton arose and laid his hand gently upon Professor Porter's bent old shoulder. "'I shall go with you, of course,' he said. "'I knew that you would offer, that you would wish to go, Mr. Clayton, but you must not. Jane is beyond human assistance now. What was once my dear little girl shall not lie alone and friendless in the awful jungle. The same vines and leaves will cover us, the same rains beat upon us, and when the spirit of her mother is abroad it will find us together in death, as it has always found us in life. No, it is I alone who may go, for she was my daughter, all that was left on earth for me to love. I shall go with you, said Clayton simply. The old man looked up, regarding the strong handsome face of William Cecil Clayton intently. Perhaps he read there the love that lay in the heart beneath, the love for his daughter. He had been too preoccupied with his own scholarly thoughts in the past to consider the little occurrences, the chance words, 
which would have indicated to a more practical man that these young people were being drawn more and more closely to one another. Now they came back to him, one by one. "'As you wish,' he said. "'You may count on me also,' said Mr. Flander. "'No, my dear old friend,' said Professor Porter. "'We may not all go. It would be cruelly wicked to leave poor Esmeralda here alone, and three of us would be no more successful than one. There be enough dead things in the cruel forest as it is. Come, let us try to sleep a little.' End of chapter. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 19 The Call of the Primitive From the time Tarzan left the tribe of great anthropoids in which he had been raised, it was torn by continual strife and discord. Turcos proved a cruel and capricious king, so that, one by one, many of the older and weaker apes, upon whom he was particularly prone to vent his brutish nature, took their families and sought the quiet and safety of the far interior. But at last those who remained were driven to desperation by the continued truculence of Turcos, and it so happened that one of them recalled the parting admonition of Tarzan. "'If you have a chief who is cruel, do not do as the other apes do.' and attempt any one of you to pit yourself against him alone. But, instead, let two or three or four of you attack him together. Then, if you will do this, no chief will dare to be other than he should be, for four of you can kill any chief who may ever be over you. And the ape who recalled this wise counsel repeated it to several of his fellows, so that when Turcos returned to the tribe that day he found a warm reception awaiting him. There were no formalities. As Turcos reached the group, five huge hairy beasts sprang upon him. At heart he was an errant coward, which is the way with bullies among apes as well as among men, so he did not remain to fight and die, but tore himself away from them as quickly as he could, and fled into the sheltering boughs of the forest. Two more attempts he made to rejoin the tribe, but on each occasion he was set upon and driven away. At last he gave it up, and turned, foaming with rage and hatred, into the jungle. For several days he wandered aimlessly, nursing his spite and looking for some weak thing on which to vent his pent anger. It was in this state of mind that the horrible, man-like beast, swinging from tree to tree, came suddenly upon two women in the jungle. He was right above them when he discovered them. The first intimation Jane Porter had of his presence was when the great hairy body dropped to the earth beside her, and she saw the awful face and the snarling hideous mouth thrust within a foot of her. One piercing scream escaped her lips as the brute hand clutched her arm. Then she was dragged toward those awful fangs which yawned at her throat. But ere they touched that fair skin, another mood claimed the anthropoid. The tribe had kept his women. He must find others to replace them. This hairless white ape would be the first of his new household, and so he threw her roughly across his broad hairy shoulders, and leaped back into the trees, bearing Jane away. Esmeralda's scream of terror had mingled once with that of Jane, and then, as was Esmeralda's manner under stress of emergency which required presence of mind, she swooned. But Jane did not once lose consciousness. It is true that that awful face, pressing close to hers, and the stench of the foul breath beating upon her nostrils, paralyzed her with terror. But her brain was clear, and she comprehended all that transpired. With what seemed to her marvelous rapidity the brute bore her through the forest, but still she did not cry out or struggle. The sudden advent of the ape had confused her to such an extent that she thought now that he was bearing her toward the beach. For this reason she conserved her energies and her voice, until she could see that they had approached near enough to the camp to attract the succor she craved. She could not have known it, but she was being borne farther and farther into the impenetrable jungle. The scream that had brought Clayton and the two older men stumbling through the undergrowth 
had led Tarzan of the Apes straight to where Esmeralda lay. But it was not Esmeralda in whom his interest centred, though pausing over her he saw that she was unhurt. For a moment he scrutinized the ground below and the trees above, until the ape that was in him by virtue of training and environment, combined with the intelligence that was his by right of birth, told his wondrous woodcraft the whole story as plainly as though he had seen the thing happen with his own eyes. And then he was gone again into the swaying trees, following the high-flung spoor which no other human eye could have detected, much less translated. At bough's ends, where the anthropoid swings from one tree to another, there is most to mark the trail, but least to point the direction of the quarry, for there the pressure is downward always, toward the small end of the branch, whether the ape be leaving or entering a tree. Nearer the centre of the tree, where the signs of passage are fainter, the direction is plainly marked. Here on this branch a caterpillar has been crushed by the fugitive's great foot, and Tarzan knows instinctively where that same foot would touch in the next stride. Here he looks to find a tiny particle of the demolished larva, oft-times not more than a speck of moisture. Again a minute bit of bark has been upturned by the scraping hand, and the direction of the break indicates the direction of the passage. Or some great limb, or the stem of the tree itself, has been brushed by the hairy body, and a tiny shred of hair tells him by the direction from which it is wedged beneath the bark that he is on the right trail nor does he need to check his speed to catch these seemingly faint records of the fleeing beast. To Tarzan they stand out boldly against all the myriad other scars and bruises and signs upon the leafy way. But strongest of all is the scent, for Tarzan is pursuing up the wind, and his trained nostrils are as sensitive as a hound's. There are those who believe that the lower orders are specially endowed by nature with better olfactory nerves than man but it is merely a matter of development. Man's survival does not hinge so greatly upon the perfection of his senses. His power to reason has relieved them of many of their duties, and so they have, to some extent, atrophied, as have the muscles which move the ears and scalp, merely from disuse. The muscles are there, about the ears and beneath the scalp, and so are the nerves which transmit sensations to the brain but they are underdeveloped because they are not needed. Not so with Tarzan of the Apes. From early infancy his survival had depended upon acuteness of eyesight, hearing, smell, touch, and taste, far more than upon the more slowly developed organ of reason. The least developed of all in Tarzan was the sense of taste, for he could eat luscious fruits, or raw flesh, long buried with almost equal appreciation, but in that he differed but slightly from more civilized epicures. Almost silently the ape-man sped on in the track of Turkoz and his prey, but the sound of his approach reached the ears of the fleeing beast, and spurred it on to greater speed. Three miles were covered before Tarzan overtook them, and then Turkoz, seeing that further flight was futile, dropped to the ground in a small open glade, that he might turn and fight for his prize, or be free to escape unhampered if he saw that the pursuer was more than a match for him. He still grasped Jane in one great arm, as Tarzan bounded like a leopard into the arena which nature had provided for this primeval-like battle. When Turkoz saw that it was Tarzan who pursued him, he jumped to the conclusion that this was Tarzan's woman, since they were of the same kind, white and hairless, and so he rejoiced at this opportunity for double revenge upon his hated enemy. To Jane the strange apparition of this godlike man was as wine to sick nerves. From the description which Clayton and her father and Mr. Philander had given her, she knew that it must be the same wonderful creature who had saved them, and she saw in him only a protector and a friend. But as Turkoz pushed her roughly aside to meet Tarzan's charge, and she saw the great proportions of the ape, and the mighty muscles, and the fierce fangs, her heart quailed. How could any vanquish such a mighty antagonist? Like two charging bulls they came together, and like two wolves 
sought each other's throat. Against the long canines of the ape was pitted the thin blade of the man's knife. Jane, her lithe young form flattened against the trunk of a great tree, her hands tightly pressed against her rising and falling bosom, and her eyes wide with mingled horror, fascination, fear, and admiration, watched the primordial ape battle with the primeval man for possession of a woman, for her. As the great muscles of the man's back and shoulders knotted beneath the tension of his efforts, and the huge biceps and forearm held at bay those mighty tusks, the veil of centuries of civilization and culture were swept from the blurred vision of the Baltimore girl. When the long knife drank deep a dozen times of Turcos's heart's blood, and the great carcass rolled lifeless upon the ground, it was a primeval woman who sprang forward with outstretched arms toward the primeval man who had fought for her and won her. And Tarzan? He did what no red-blooded man needs lessons in doing. He took his woman in his arms and smothered her upturned, panting lips with kisses. For a moment Jane lay there with half-closed eyes. For a moment, the first in her young life, she knew the meaning of love. But as suddenly as the veil had been withdrawn, it dropped again and an outraged conscience suffused her face with its scarlet mantle, and a mortified woman thrust Tarzan of the apes from her, and buried her face in her hands. Tarzan had been surprised when he had found the girl he had learned to love, after a vague and abstract manner, a willing prisoner in his arms. Now he was surprised that she repulsed him. He came close to her once more, and took hold of her arms. She turned upon him like a tigress, striking his great breast with her tiny hands. Tarzan could not understand it. A moment ago, and it had been his intention to hasten Jane back to her people, but that little moment was lost now in the dim and distant past of things which were, but can never be again, and with it the good intentions had gone to join the impossible. Since then Tarzan of the Apes had felt a warm, lithe form close pressed to his. Hot, sweet breath against his cheek and mouth had fanned a new flame to life within his breast, and perfect lips had clung to his in burning kisses that had seared a deep brand into his soul, a brand which marked a new Tarzan. Again he laid his hand upon her arm. Again she repulsed him and then Tarzan of the Apes did just what his first ancestor would have done. He took his woman in his arms and carried her into the jungle. Early the following morning, the four within the little cabin by the beach were awakened by the booming of a cannon. Clayton was the first to rush out, and there, beyond the harbor's mouth, he saw two vessels lying at anchor. One was the Arrow, and the other a small French cruiser, the sides of the latter were crowded with men gazing shoreward, and it was evident to Clayton, as to the others who had now joined him, that the gun which they had heard had been fired to attract their attention if they still remained at the cabin. Both vessels lay at a considerable distance from shore, and it was doubtful if their glasses would locate the waving hats of the little party far in between the harbor's points. Esmeralda had removed her red apron, and was waving it frantically above her head. But Clayton, still fearing that even this might not be seen, hurried off toward the northern point, where lay his signal pyre ready for the match. It seemed an age to him, as to those who waited breathlessly behind, ere he reached the great pile of dry branches and underbrush. As he broke from the dense wood and came in sight of the vessels again, he was filled with consternation to see that the arrow was making sail, and that the cruiser was already under way. Quickly lighting the pyre in a dozen places, he hurried to the extreme point of the promontory, where he stripped off his shirt, and tying it to a fallen branch, stood waving it back and forth above him. But still the vessels continued to stand out, and he had given up all hope, when the great column of smoke rising above the forest in one dense vertical shaft, attracted the attention of a lookout aboard the cruiser, and instantly a dozen glasses were leveled on the beach. Presently Clayton saw the two ships come about again, 
and while the arrow lay drifting quietly on the ocean, the cruiser steamed slowly back toward shore. At some distance away she stopped, and a boat was lowered and dispatched toward the beach. As it was drawn up, a young officer stepped out. "'Monsieur Clayton, I presume?' he asked. "'Thank God you have come,' was Clayton's reply. "'And it may be that it is not too late even now.' "'What do you mean, monsieur?' asked the officer. Clayton told of the abduction of Jane Porter, and the need of armed men to aid in the search for her. "'Mon Dieu!' exclaimed the officer sadly. "'Yesterday, and it would not have been too late. Today, and it may be better that the poor lady were never found. It is horrible, monsieur, it is too horrible.' Other boats had now put off from the cruiser, and Clayton, having pointed out the harbour's entrance to the officer, entered the boat with him, and its nose was turned toward the little landlocked bay, into which the other craft followed. Soon the entire party had landed where stood Professor Porter, Mr. Philander, and the weeping Esmeralda. Among the officers in the last boats to put off from the cruiser was the commander of the vessel, and when he had heard the story of Jane's abduction, he generously called for volunteers to accompany Professor Porter and Clayton in their search. Not an officer or a man was there of those brave and sympathetic Frenchmen who did not quickly beg leave to be one of the expedition. The commander selected twenty men and two officers, Lieutenant Darnot and Lieutenant Charpentier. A boat was dispatched to the cruiser for provisions, ammunition, and carbines. The men were already armed with revolvers. Then, to Clayton's inquiries as to how they had happened to anchor offshore and fire a signal gun, the commander, Captain Dufran, explained that a month before they had sighted the arrow bearing southwest under considerable canvas, and that when they had signaled her to come about she had but crowded on more sail. They had kept her hull up until sunset, firing several shots after her, but the next morning she was nowhere to be seen. They had then continued to cruise up and down the coast for several weeks, and had about forgotten the incident of the recent chase, when, Early one morning, a few days before, the lookout had described a vessel laboring in the trough of a heavy sea, and evidently entirely out of control. As they steamed nearer to the derelict, they were surprised to note that it was the same vessel that had run from them a few weeks earlier. Her forestaysail and mizzen spanker were set as though an effort had been made to hold her head up into the wind, but the sheets had parted and the sails were tearing to ribbons in the half-gale of wind. In the high sea that it was running it was a difficult and dangerous task to attempt to put a prize-crew aboard her, and as no signs of life had been seen above deck, it was decided to stand by until the wind and sea abated, but just then a figure was seen clinging to the rail and feebly waving a mute signal of despair toward them. Immediately a boat's crew was ordered out and an attempt was successfully made to board the arrow. The sight that met the Frenchmen's eyes as they clambered over the ship's side was appalling. A dozen dead and dying men rolled hither and thither upon the pitching deck, the living intermingled with the dead. Two of the corpses appeared to have been partially devoured as though by wolves. The prize crew soon had the vessel under proper sail once more and the living members of the ill-starred company carried below to their hammocks. The dead were wrapped in tarpaulins and lashed on deck, to be identified by their comrades before being consigned to the deep. None of the living was conscious when the Frenchman reached the arrow's deck. Even the poor devil who had waved the single despairing signal of distress had lapsed into unconsciousness before he had learned whether it had availed or not. It did not take the French officer long to learn what had caused the terrible condition aboard, for when water and brandy were sought to restore the men, it was found that there was none, nor even food of any description. He immediately signaled to the cruiser to send water, medicine, and provisions, and another boat made the perilous trip to the Arrow. When restoratives had been applied, several of the men regained consciousness, and then the whole story was told. That part of it we know up to the sailing of the arrow after the murder of Snipes, and the burial of his body above the treasure-chest. 
it seems that the pursuit by the cruiser had so terrorized the mutineers that they had continued out across the Atlantic for several days after losing her, but on discovering the meagre supply of water and provisions aboard, they had turned back toward the east. With no one on board who understood navigation, discussions soon arose as to their whereabouts, and as three days sailing to the east did not raise land, they bore off to the north, fearing that the high north winds that had prevailed had driven them south of the southern extremity of Africa. They kept on a north-northeasterly course for two days, when they were overtaken by a calm which lasted for nearly a week. Their water was gone and in another day they would be without food. Conditions changed rapidly, from bad to worse. One man went mad and leaped overboard. Soon another opened his veins and drank his own blood. When he died they threw him overboard also, though there were those among them who wanted to keep the corpse on board. Hunger was changing them from human beasts to wild beasts. Two days before they had been picked up by the cruiser, they had become too weak to handle the vessel, and that same day three men died. On the following morning it was seen that one of the corpses had been partially devoured. All that day the men lay glaring at each other like beasts of prey, and the following morning two of the corpses lay almost entirely stripped of flesh. The men were but little stronger for their ghoulish repast for the want of water was by far the greatest agony with which they had to contend. And then the cruiser had come. When those who could had recovered, the entire story had been told to the French commander, but the men were too ignorant to be able to tell him at just what point on the coast the professor and his party had been marooned. So the cruiser had steamed slowly along within sight of land, firing occasional signal guns, and scanning every inch of the beach with glasses. They had anchored by night so as not to neglect a particle of the shoreline, and it had happened that the preceding night had brought them off the very beach where lay the little camp they sought. The signal guns of the afternoon before had not been heard by those on shore, it was presumed, because they had doubtless been in the thick of the jungle searching for Jane Porter for the noise of their own crashing through the underbrush would have drowned the report of a far distant gun. By the time the two parties had narrated their several adventures, the cruiser's boat had returned with supplies and arms for the expedition. Within a few minutes the little body of sailors and the two French officers, together with Professor Porter and Clayton, set off upon their hopeless and ill-fated quest into the untracked jungle. End of chapter. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 20 Heredity When Jane realized that she was being borne away a captive by the strange forest creature who had rescued her from the clutches of the ape, she struggled desperately to escape but the strong arms that held her as easily as though she had been but a day-old babe only pressed a little more tightly. So presently she gave up the futile effort and lay quietly, looking through half-closed lids at the faces of the man who strode easily through the tangled undergrowth with her. The face above her was one of extraordinary beauty. A perfect type of the strongly masculine, unmarred by dissipation or brutal or degrading passions, for, though Tarzan of the Apes was a killer of men and of beasts, he killed as the hunter kills, dispassionately, except on those rare occasions when he had killed for hate, though not the brooding, malevolent hate which marks the features of its own with hideous lines. When Tarzan killed he more often smiled than scowled, and smiles are the foundation of beauty. One thing the girl had noticed particularly when she had seen Tarzan rushing upon Turcos, the vivid scarlet band upon his forehead, from above the left eye to the scalp, but now as she scanned his features she noticed that it was gone, and only a thin white line marked the spot where it had been. As she lay more quietly in his arms, Tarzan slightly relaxed his grip upon her. Once he looked down into her eyes and smiled. 
and the girl had to close her own to shut out the vision of that handsome, winning face. Presently Tarzan took to the trees, and Jane, wondering that she felt no fear, began to realize that in many respects she had never felt more secure in her whole life than now as she lay in the arms of this strong, wild creature, being born, God alone knew where or to what fate, deeper and deeper into the savage fastness of the untamed forest. When, with closed eyes, she commenced to speculate upon the future, and terrifying fears were conjured by a vivid imagination, she had but to raise her lids and look upon that noble face so close to hers, to dissipate the last remnant of apprehension. No, he could never harm her. Of that she was convinced when she translated the fine features, and the frank, brave eyes above her, into the chivalry which they proclaimed. On and on they went through what seemed to Jane a solid mass of verdure. Yet ever there appeared to open before this forest god a passage, as by magic, which closed behind them as they passed, scarce a branch scraped against her. Yet above and below, before and behind, the view presented naught but a solid mass of inextricably interwoven branches and creepers. As Tarzan moved steadily onward, his mind was occupied with many strange and new thoughts. Here was a problem the like of which he had never encountered, and he felt rather than reasoned that he must meet it as a man and not as an ape. The free movement through the middle terrace, which was the route he had followed for the most part, had helped to cool the ardour of the first fierce passion of his new-found love. Now he discovered himself speculating upon the fate which would have fallen to the girl had he not rescued her from Turcos. He knew why the ape had not killed her, and he commenced to compare his intentions with those of Turcos. True, it was the order of the jungle for the male to take his mate by force, but could Tarzan be guided by the laws of the beasts? Was not Tarzan a man? What did men do? He was puzzled, for he did not know. He wished that he might ask the girl, and then it came to him that she had already answered him in the futile struggle she had made to escape and to repulse him. But now they had come to their destination, and Tarzan of the Apes, with Jane in his strong arms, swung lightly to the turf of the arena where the great apes held their councils, and danced the wild orgy of the dum-dum. Though they had come many miles, it was still but mid-afternoon and the amphitheatre was bathed in the half-light which filtered through the maze of encircling foliage. The green turf looked soft and cool and inviting. The myriad noises of the jungle seemed far distant and hushed to a mere echo of blurred sounds, rising and falling like the surf upon a remote shore. A feeling of dreamy peacefulness stole over Jane as she sank down upon the grass where Tarzan had placed her and as she looked up at his great figure towering above her, there was added a strange sense of perfect security. As she watched him from beneath half-closed lids, Tarzan crossed the little circular clearing toward the trees upon the farther side. She noted the graceful majesty of his carriage, the perfect symmetry of his magnificent figure, and the poise of his well-shaped head upon his broad shoulders. What a perfect creature! There could be naught of cruelty or baseness beneath that godlike exterior. Never, she thought, had such a man strode the earth since God created the first in his own image. With a bound Tarzan sprang into the trees and disappeared. Jane wondered where he had gone. Had he left her there to her fate in the lonely jungle? She glanced nervously about. Every vine and bush seemed but the lurking place of some huge and horrible beast waiting to bury gleaming fangs into her soft flesh. Every sound she magnified into the stealthy creeping of a sinuous and malignant body. How different now that he had left her! For a few minutes that seemed hours to the frightened girl, she sat with tense nerves, waiting for the spring of the crouching thing that was to end her misery of apprehension. She almost prayed for the cruel teeth that would give her unconsciousness and surcease from the agony of fear. She heard a sudden, slight sound behind her. With a cry she sprang to her feet and turned to face her end. 
There stood Tarzan, his arms filled with ripe and luscious fruit. Jane reeled and would have fallen, had not Tarzan, dropping his burden, caught her in his arms. She did not lose consciousness, but she clung tightly to him, shuddering and trembling like a frightened deer. Tarzan of the Apes stroked her soft hair and tried to comfort and quiet her, as Kayla had him when, as a little ape, he had been frightened by Sabor the lioness, or Hista the snake. Once he pressed his lips lightly upon her forehead, and she did not move, but closed her eyes and sighed. She could not analyze her feelings, nor did she wish to attempt it. She was satisfied to feel the safety of those strong arms and to leave her future to fate, for the last few hours had taught her to trust this strange wild creature of the forest, as she would have trusted but few of the men of her acquaintance. As she thought of the strangeness of it, there commenced to dawn upon her the realization that she had, possibly, learned something else which she had never really known before. Love. She wondered, and then she smiled and still smiling she pushed Tarzan gently away, and looking at him with a half-smiling, half-quizzical expression that made her face wholly entrancing, she pointed to the fruit upon the ground, and seated herself upon the edge of the earthen drum of the anthropoids, for hunger was asserting itself. Tarzan quickly gathered up the fruit, and bringing it, laid it at her feet, and then he too sat upon the drum beside her and with his knife opened and prepared the various fruits for her meal. Together and in silence they ate, occasionally stealing sly glances at one another, until finally Jane broke into a merry laugh in which Tarzan joined. "'I wish you spoke English,' said the girl. Tarzan shook his head, and an expression of wistful and pathetic longing sobered his laughing eyes. Then Jane tried speaking to him in French and then in German, but she had to laugh at her own blundering attempt at the latter tongue. Anyway, she said to him in English, you understand my German as well as they did in Berlin. <laughs> Tarzan had long since reached a decision as to what his future procedure should be. He had had time to recollect all that he had read of the ways of men and women in the books at the cabin. He would act as he imagined the men in the books would have acted were they in his place. Again he rose and went into the trees, but first he tried to explain by means of signs that he would return shortly, and he did so well that Jane understood and was not afraid when he had gone. Only a feeling of loneliness came over her, and she watched the point where he had disappeared, with longing eyes, awaiting his return. As before, she was appraised of his presence by a soft sound behind her, and turned to see him coming across the turf with a great armful of branches. Then he went back again into the jungle, and in a few minutes reappeared with a quantity of soft grasses and ferns. Two more trips he made until he had quite a pile of material at hand. Then he spread the ferns and grasses upon the ground in a soft, flat bed, and above it leaned many branches together so that they met a few feet over its centre. Upon these he spread layers of huge leaves of the great elephant's ear, and with more branches and more leaves he closed one end of the little shelter he had built. Then they sat down together again upon the edge of the drum, and tried to talk by signs. The magnificent diamond locket which hung about Tarzan's neck had been a source of much wonderment to Jane. She pointed to it now, and Tarzan removed it and handed the pretty bauble to her. She saw that it was the work of a skilled artisan, and that the diamonds were of great brilliancy and superbly set, but the cutting of them denoted that they were of a former day. She noticed, too, that the locket opened, and, pressing the hidden clasp, she saw the two halves spring apart to reveal in either section an ivory miniature. One was of a beautiful woman, and the other might have been a likeness of the man who sat beside her except for a subtle difference of expression that was scarcely definable. She looked up at Tarzan to find him leaning toward her, gazing on the miniatures, with an expression of astonishment. He reached out his hand for the locket, and took it away from her, examining the likenesses within it with unmistakable signs of surprise and new interest. 
His manner clearly denoted that he had never before seen them, nor imagined that the lock had opened. This fact caused Jane to indulge in further speculation, and it taxed her imagination to picture how this beautiful ornament came into the possession of a wild and savage creature of the unexplored jungles of Africa. Still more wonderful was how it contained the likeness of one who might be a brother, or, more likely, the father of this woodland demigod who was even ignorant of the fact that the locket opened. Tarzan was still gazing with fixity at the two faces. Presently he removed the quiver from his shoulder, and emptying the arrows upon the ground, reached into the bottom of the bag-like receptacle, and drew forth a flat object, wrapped in many soft leaves, and tied with bits of long grass. Carefully he unwrapped it, removing layer after layer of leaves, until at length he held a photograph in his hand. Pointing to the miniature of the man within the locket, he handed the photograph to Jane, holding the open locket beside it. The photograph only served to puzzle the girl still more, for it was evidently another likeness of the same man, whose picture rested in the locket beside that of the beautiful young woman. Tarzan was looking at her with an expression of puzzled bewilderment in his eyes as she glanced up at him. He seemed to be framing a question with his lips. The girl pointed to the photograph, and then to the miniature, and then to him, as though to indicate that she thought the likenesses were of him. But he only shook his head, and then, shrugging his great shoulders, he took the photograph from her, and having carefully rewrapped it, placed it again in the bottom of his quiver. For a few moments he sat in silence, his eyes bent upon the ground, while Jane held the little locket in her hand, turning it over and over in an endeavour to find some further clue that might lead to the identity of its original owner. At length a simple explanation occurred to her. The locket had belonged to Lord Greystoke, and the likenesses were of himself and Lady Alice. This wild creature had simply found it in the cabin by the beach. How stupid of her not to have thought of that solution before! But to account for the strange likeness between Lord Greystoke and this forest god, that was quite beyond her, and it is not strange that she could not imagine that this naked savage was indeed an English nobleman. At length Tarzan looked up to watch the girl as she examined the locket. He could not fathom the meaning of the faces within but he could read the interest and fascination upon the face of the live young creature by his side. She noticed that he was watching her, and thinking that he wished his ornament again, she held it out to him. He took it from her, and, taking the chain in his two hands, he placed it about her neck, smiling at her expression of surprise at this unexpected gift. Jane shook her head vehemently, and would have removed the golden links from about her throat, but Tarzan would not let her. Taking her hands in his, when she insisted upon it, he held them tightly to prevent her. At last she desisted, and with a little laugh raised the locket to her lips. Tarzan did not know precisely what she meant, but he guessed correctly that it was her way of acknowledging the gift, and so he rose, and taking the locket in his hand, stooped gravely like some courtier of old, and pressed his lips upon it where hers had rested. It was a stately and gallant little compliment, performed with the grace and dignity of utter unconsciousness of self. It was the hallmark of his aristocratic birth, the natural outcropping of many generations of fine breeding, an hereditary instinct of graciousness which a lifetime of uncouth and savage training and environment could not eradicate. It was growing dark now, and so they ate again of the fruit which was both food and drink for them. Then Tarzan rose, and leading Jane to the little bower he had erected, motioned her to go within. For the first time in hours a feeling of fear swept over her, and Tarzan felt her draw away as though shrinking from him. Contact with this girl for half a day had left a very different Tarzan from the one on whom the morning sun had risen. Now, in every fibre of his being, heredity spoke louder than training. He had not in one swift transition become a polished gentleman from a savage ape-man, 
but at last the instincts of the former predominated, and over all was the desire to please the woman he loved, and to appear well in her eyes. So Tarzan of the Apes did the only thing he knew to assure Jane of her safety. He removed his hunting-knife from its sheath, and handed it to her hilt first, again motioning her into the bower. The girl understood, and taking the long knife she entered, and lay down upon the soft grasses, while Tarzan of the Apes stretched himself upon the ground across the entrance. And thus the rising sun found them in the morning. When Jane awoke, she did not at first recall the strange events of the preceding day, and so she wondered at her odd surroundings, the little leafy bower, the soft grasses of her bed, the unfamiliar prospect from the opening at her feet. Slowly the circumstances of her position crept one by one into her mind, and then a great wonderment arose in her heart, a mighty wave of thankfulness and gratitude that though she had been in such terrible danger, yet she was unharmed. She moved to the entrance of the shelter to look for Tarzan. He was gone, but this time no fear assailed her, for she knew that he would return. In the grass at the entrance to her bower she saw the imprint of his body, where he had lain all night to guard her. She knew that the fact that he had been there was all that had permitted her to sleep in such peaceful security. With him near, who could entertain fear? She wondered if there was another man on earth with whom a girl could feel so safe in the heart of this savage African jungle. Even the lions and panthers had no fears for her now. She looked up to see his lithe form drop softly from a nearby tree. As he caught her eyes upon him, his face lighted with that frank and radiant smile that had won her confidence the day before. As he approached her, Jane's heart beat faster, and her eyes brightened as they had never done before at the approach of any man. He had again been gathering fruit, and this he laid at the entrance of her bower. Once more they sat down together to eat. Jane commenced to wonder what his plans were. Would he take her back to the beach, or would he keep her here? Suddenly she realized that the matter did not seem to give her much concern. Could it be that she did not care? She began to comprehend, also, that she was entirely contented, sitting here by the side of this smiling giant, eating delicious fruit in a sylvan paradise, far within the remote depths of an African jungle that she was contented and very happy. She could not understand it. Her reason told her that she should be torn by wild anxieties, weighted by dread fears, cast down by gloomy forebodings. But instead her heart was singing, and she was smiling into the answering face of the man beside her. When they had finished their breakfast Tarzan went to her bower and recovered his knife. The girl had entirely forgotten it. She realized that it was because she had forgotten the fear that prompted her to accept it. Motioning her to follow, Tarzan walked toward the trees at the edge of the arena, and taking her in one strong arm swung to the branches above. The girl knew that he was taking her back to her people, and she could not understand the sudden feeling of loneliness and sorrow which crept over her. For hours they swung slowly along. Tarzan of the Apes did not hurry. He tried to draw out the sweet pleasure of that journey with those dear arms about his neck as long as possible, and so he went far south of the direct route to the beach. Several times they halted for brief rests, which Tarzan did not need, and at noon they stopped for an hour at a little brook where they quenched their thirst and ate. So it was nearly sunset when they came to the clearing and Tarzan, dropping to the ground beside a great tree, parted the tall jungle grass and pointed out the little cabin to her. She took him by the hand to lead him to it, that she might tell her father that this man had saved her from death, and worse than death, that he had watched over her as carefully as a mother might have done. But again the timidity of the wild thing in the face of human habitation swept over Tarzan of the apes. He drew back, shaking his head. The girl came closer to him, looking up with pleading eyes. Somehow she could not bear the thought of his going back into the terrible jungle alone. Still he shook his head, 
and finally he drew her to him very gently, and stooped to kiss her. But first he looked into her eyes, and waited to learn if she was pleased, or if she would repulse him. Just an instant the girl hesitated, and then she realized the truth, and throwing her arms about his neck she drew his face to hers and kissed him, unashamed. "'I love you! I love you!' she murmured. From far in the distance came the faint sound of many guns. Tarzan and Jane raised their heads. From the cabin came Mr. Philander and Esmeralda. From where Tarzan and the girl stood they could not see the two vessels lying at anchor in the harbour. Tarzan pointed towards the sounds, touched his breast, and pointed again. She understood. He was going, and something told her that it was because he thought her people were in danger. Again he kissed her. "'Come back to me,' she whispered. "'I shall wait for you. Always.' He was gone, and Jane turned to walk across the clearing to the cabin. Mr. Philander was the first to see her. It was dusk, and Mr. Philander was very nearsighted. "'Quickly, Esmeralda!' he cried. "'Let us seek safety within. It is a lioness. Bless me!' Esmeralda did not bother to verify Mr. Philander's vision. His tone was enough. She was within the cabin, and had slammed and bolted the door before he had finished pronouncing her name. The bless me was startled out of Mr. Philander by the discovery that Esmeralda, in the exuberance of her haste, had fastened him upon the same side of the door as was the close approaching lioness. He beat furiously upon the heavy portal. Esmeralda! Esmeralda! he shrieked. Let me in! I am being devoured by a lion! Esmeralda thought that the noise upon the door was made by the lioness in her attempts to pursue her, so, after her custom, she fainted. Mr. Philander cast a frightened glance behind him. Horrors! The thing was quite close now. He tried to scramble up the side of the cabin, and succeeded in catching a fleeting hold upon the thatched roof. For a moment he hung there, clawing with his feet like a cat on a clothesline. But presently a piece of the thatch came away, and Mr. Philander, preceding it, was precipitated upon his back. At the instant he fell a remarkable item of natural history leaped to his mind. If one feigns death, lions and lionesses are supposed to ignore one, according to Mr. Philander's faulty memory. So Mr. Philander lay as he had fallen, frozen into the horrid semblance of death. As his arms and legs had been extended stiffly upward as he came to earth upon his back, the attitude of death was anything but impressive. Jane had been watching his antics in mild-eyed surprise. Now she laughed, a little choking gurgle of a laugh, but it was enough. Mr. Philander rolled over upon his side and peered about. At length he discovered her. "'Jane!' he cried. "'Jane Porter! Bless me!' He scrambled to his feet and rushed toward her. He could not believe that it was she, and alive. "'Bless me! Where did you come from? Where in the world have you been? How—' "'Mercy, Mr. Philander,' interrupted the girl. "'I can never remember so many questions.' "'Well, well,' said Mr. Philander. "'Bless me! I am so filled with surprise and exuberant delight at seeing you safe and well again, that I scarcely know what I am saying, really. But come, tell me all that has happened to you.' End of chapter. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 21 The Village of Torture As the little expedition of sailors toiled through the dense jungle, searching for signs of Jane Porter, the futility of their venture became more and more apparent, but the grief of the old man and the hopeless eyes of the young Englishman prevented the kind-hearted Darnot from turning back. He thought that there might be a bare possibility of finding her body, or the remains of it, for he was positive that she had been devoured by some beast of prey. He deployed his men into a skirmish line from the point where Esmeralda had been found, and in this extended formation they pushed their way, sweating and panting, through the tangled vines and creepers. It was slow work. 
Noon found them but a few miles inland. They halted for a brief rest then, and after pushing on for a short distance further, one of the men discovered a well-marked trail. It was an old elephant track, and Darnot, after consulting with Professor Porter and Clayton, decided to follow it. The path wound through the jungle in a northeasterly direction, and along it the column moved in single file. Lieutenant Darnot was in the lead, and moving at a quick pace, for the trail was comparatively open. Immediately behind him came Professor Porter, but as he could not keep pace with the younger man, Darnot was a hundred yards in advance, when suddenly a half-dozen black warriors arose about him. Darnot gave a warning shout to his column as the blacks closed on him, but before he could draw his revolver he had been pinioned and dragged into the jungle. His cry had alarmed the sailors, and a dozen of them sprang forward past Professor Porter, running up the trail to their officer's aid. They did not know the cause of his outcry, only that it was a warning of danger ahead. They had rushed past the spot where Darnot had been seized when a spear hurled from the jungle transfixed one of the men, and then a volley of arrows fell among them. Raising their rifles they fired into the underbrush in the direction from which the missiles had come. By this time the balance of the party had come up, and volley after volley was fired toward the concealed foe. It was these shots that Tarzan and Jane Porter had heard. Lieutenant Charpentier, who had been bringing up the rear of the column, now came running to the scene, and on hearing the details of the ambush ordered the men to follow him, and plunged into the tangled vegetation. In an instant they were in a hand-to-hand -hand fight with some fifty black warriors of Mbonga's village. Arrows and bullets flew thick and fast. Queer African knives and French gun-butts mingled for a moment in savage and bloody duels, but soon the natives fled into the jungle, leaving the Frenchmen to count their losses. Four of the twenty were dead, a dozen others were wounded, and Lieutenant Darnot was missing. Night was falling rapidly, and their predicament was rendered doubly worse when they could not even find the elephant trail which they had been following. There was but one thing to do, make camp where they were until daylight. Lieutenant Charpentier ordered a clearing made and a circular abattis of underbrush constructed about the camp. This work was not completed until long after dark, the men building a huge fire in the center of the clearing to give them light to work by. When all was safe as possible against attack of wild beasts and savage men, Lieutenant Charpentier placed sentries about the little camp, and the tired and hungry men threw themselves upon the ground to sleep. The groans of the wounded mingled with the roaring and growling of the great beasts which the noise and firelight had attracted, kept sleep, except in its most fitful form, from the tired eyes. It was a sad and hungry party that lay through the long night, praying for dawn. The blacks who had seized Darnot had not waited to participate in the fight which followed, but instead had dragged their prisoner a little way through the jungle, and then struck the trail further on beyond the scene of the fighting in which their fellows were engaged. They hurried him along, the sounds of battle growing fainter and fainter as they drew away from the contestants, until there suddenly broke upon Darnot's vision a good-sized clearing at the end of which stood a thatched and palisaded village. It was now dusk, but the watchers at the gate saw the approaching trio and distinguished one as a prisoner ere they reached the portals. A cry went up within the palisade. A great throng of women and children rushed out to meet the party, and then began for the French officer the most terrifying experience which man can encounter upon earth, the reception of a white prisoner into a village of African cannibals. To add to the fiendishness of their cruel savagery was the poignant memory of still crueler barbarities practiced upon them and theirs by the white officers of that arch-hypocrite Leopold II of Belgium, because of whose atrocities they had fled the Congo Free State, a pitiful remnant of what once had been a mighty tribe. They fell upon Darnot tooth and nail, beating him with sticks and stones and tearing at him with claw-like hands. Every vestige of clothing was torn from him, and the merciless blows fell upon his bare and quivering flesh. But not once did the Frenchman cry out in pain. He breathed a silent prayer that he be quickly delivered from his torture. 
but the death he prayed for was not to be so easily had. Soon the warriors beat the women away from their prisoner. He was to be saved for nobler sport than this, and the first wave of their passion having subsided, they contented themselves with crying out taunts and insults, and spitting upon him. Presently they reached the center of the village. There Darnot was bound securely to the great post from which no live man had ever been released. A number of the women scattered to their several huts to fetch pots and water, while others built a row of fires on which portions of the feast were to be broiled, while the balance would be slowly dried in strips for future use, as they expected the other warriors to return with many prisoners. The festivities were delayed awaiting the return of the warriors who had remained to engage in the skirmish with the white men, so that it was quite late when all were in the village, and the dance of death commenced to circle around the doomed officer. Half fainting from pain and exhaustion, Darnot watched from beneath half-closed lids what seemed but the vagary of delirium, or some horrid nightmare from which he must soon awake. The bestial faces, daubed with color, the huge mouths and flabby hanging lips, the yellow teeth sharp-filed, the rolling demon eyes, the shining naked bodies, the cruel spears. Surely no such creatures really existed upon earth. He must indeed be dreaming. The savage whirling bodies circled nearer. Now a spear sprang forth and touched his arm. The sharp pain and the feel of hot trickling blood assured him of the awful reality of his hopeless position. Another spear, and then another touched him. He closed his eyes and held his teeth firm set he would not cry out. He was a soldier of France, and he would teach these beasts how an officer and a gentleman died. Tarzan of the Apes needed no interpreter to translate the story of those distant shots. With Jane Porter's kisses still warm upon his lips, he was swinging with incredible rapidity through the forest trees straight toward the village of Mabonga. He was not interested in the location of the encounter, for he judged that that would soon be over. Those who were killed he could not aid, those who escaped would not need his assistance. It was to those who had neither been killed or escaped that he hastened, and he knew that he would find them by the great post in the center of Mabonga village. Many times had Tarzan seen Mabonga's black raiding parties return from the northward with prisoners, and always were the same scenes enacted about that grim stake beneath the flaring light of many fires. He knew, too, that they seldom lost much time before consummating the fiendish purpose of their captures. He doubted that he would arrive in time to do more than avenge. On he sped. Night had fallen, and he traveled high along the upper terrace where the gorgeous tropic moon lighted the dizzy pathway through the gently undulating branches of the treetops. Presently he caught the reflection of a distant blaze, it lay to the right of his path. It must be the light from the campfire the two men had built before they were attacked. Tarzan knew nothing of the presence of the sailors. So sure was Tarzan of his jungle knowledge that he did not turn from his course, but passed the glare at a distance of a half-mile. It was the campfire of the Frenchman. In a few minutes more Tarzan swung into the trees above Mbonga's village. Ah, he was not quite too late, or was he? He could not tell. The figure at the stake was very still, yet the black warriors were but pricking it. Tarzan knew their customs. The death blow had not been struck. He could tell almost to a minute how far the dance had gone. In another instant Mbonga's knife would sever one of the victim's ears. That would mark the beginning of the end, for very shortly after only a writhing mass of mutilated flesh would remain. There would still be life in it, but death then would be the only charity it craved. The stake stood forty feet from the nearest tree. Tarzan coiled his rope. Then there rose suddenly above the fiendish cries of the dancing demons the awful challenge of the ape-man. The dancers halted as though turned to stone. The rope sped with singing whirr high above the heads of the blacks. It was quite invisible in the flaring lights of the campfires. Darnot opened his eyes. A huge black, standing directly before him, lunged backward as though felled by an invisible hand. 
struggling and shrieking, his body, rolling from side to side, moved quickly toward the shadows beneath the leaves. The blacks, their eyes protruding in horror, watched spellbound. Once beneath the trees, the body rose straight into the air, and as it disappeared into the foliage above, the terrified negroes, screaming with fright, broke into a mad race for the village gate. Darnot was left alone. He was a brave man, but he had felt the short hairs bristle upon the nape of his neck when that uncanny cry rose upon the air. As the writhing body of the black soared, as though by unearthly power, into the dense foliage of the forest, Darnot felt an icy shiver run along his spine, as though death had risen from a dark grave and laid a cold and clammy finger on his flesh. As Darnot watched the spot where the body had entered the tree, he heard the sounds of movement there. The branches swayed as though under the weight of a man's body. There was a crash, and the black came sprawling to earth again, to lie very quietly where he had fallen. Immediately after him came a white body, but this one alighted erect. Darnot saw a clean-limbed young giant emerge from the shadows into the firelight and come quickly toward him. What could it mean? Who could it be? Some new creature of torture and destruction, doubtless. Darnot waited. His eyes never left the face of the advancing man nor did the other's frank, clear eyes waver beneath Darnot's fixed gaze. Darnot was reassured, but still without much hope, though he felt that that face could not mask a cruel heart. Without a word Tarzan of the apes cut the bonds which held the Frenchman. Weak from suffering and loss of blood, he would have fallen but for the strong arm that caught him. He felt himself lifted from the ground. There was a sensation as of flying, and then he lost consciousness. End of chapter.